My name is Charles Matthews and I'm here today with Moki Makura. Moki is a storyteller and has been involved in story in many, many different ways. Um, Moki was behind Africa's greatest entrepreneurs, uh, worked in getting kind of nolly books and nolly stories out throughout Africa, has worked in kind of key narratives across Africa, and um, is back in story with Africa No Filter, a bold new initiative to retell and reimagine Africa's story and present it to the world. Welcome, Moki. Hello, um, The first thing I'd like to ask you today is who are you and how has story impacted your life and made you who you are as a human? Hmm, who am I? It's a deep one. For... <laughs> well, you know, I always say that I was born in Nigeria and that defined me. I was educated UK and that sort of empowered me and then I've been in South Africa for over 20 years and I feel that South Africa gave me all the opportunities to put my talent to play and it's continued to do that. Um, storytelling has always been a big part um, of my life and I, I remember when I was younger I got led into reading by reading Mills and Boots. That was, you know, I used to devour these. I mean, I, I assume everyone knows what Mills and Boons are, those cheap romantic literature books that you, you know, find. Um, and there were just, there were always characters I didn't recognize, a Blade and Rebecca and in situations that I didn't recognize, but I love them because I love the storytelling aspect. So it's always been in me that I was reading about people in places I didn't know and didn't really understand as an African child growing up in Africa. And I've always wanted, been interested in our stories as Africans. So that's been a really key driving force in a lot of things I did in the book that I wrote, the books that I've written, um, the things, like the initiatives I've been involved in, the TV series. It's about let's tell our stories because I feel that, you know, storytelling is an incredible, powerful tool to putting new ideas in the world. And how much better if those ideas come from people you recognize? Um, how much more inspiring if somebody's story is one, somebody's somebody is somebody that you recognize um, rather than a random person that, you know, a different color, a different place. I don't know. I feel the importance of us telling our stories has always been a key motivator for me. And it's just driven a lot of things I do to this day, right now, what I'm doing right now. If you look at Africa's story, a big problem that we've had is um, the volume of media and the volume of media that is telling Africa's story that is not Africa. Yeah, and um, we see it in um, huge uh, brands like Facebook um, that are so present in Africa, and uh, they're carried by the virtue virtue of the very makeup of those um, huge ecosystems, uh, carry huge kind of uh, uh, Western centric messages into our world, and kind of we see kind of very dominant uh, narratives bearing down both in terms of story and in terms of volume, how will Africa you know, filter work to kind of overcome that? But also kind of how do we break through kind of all the noise and uh, start to tell a story with meaning that is kind of an African story told by Africans? There's quite a lot of questions in there. Um, but let me deal with the, the platforms one first about, you know, platforms like, you know, Facebook and, and in fact, most of our social media platforms, you know, all... For me, all of those things are platforms and they, they themselves are nothing without the content that people upload onto them. Now, if you look at by sheer numbers alone, there's a billion Africans, not all of them have access. So the skew probably is that we are not in charge of telling our own stories. We're just not enough of us probably on these platforms, right? If you compare um, the number of Americans who, who have easy access to data, um, affordable data. So we don't own the platforms, which is fine, but we are not on those platforms in enough volume to be heard with our stories. And also more importantly, the spaces we occupy and not the spaces where we are being heard. Because there is a lot of African storytelling that happens there. And if you do scour the internet, if you know what to look for and you're looking for the right thing, it's there, but it's not in the right places, not in the right spaces, and it's, there's not enough of it. So one of the things that African Unfilter is going to try and do is try and sort of identify where, the ch where, where there's a lack a story for us. And I think one clear place we've already identified that when it comes to stories about innovation and creativity, people very, very, very rarely look to Africa for this. You know, when we're talking about innovation, particularly even around COVID, um, just 
the innovation comes from somewhere else, the work around a new vaccine, all the innovations come from elsewhere. They never seem to come from Africa. And Africa always seems to be positioned as the recipient of the world's innovation. It's the it's the one, it's, you know, that's the story of Africa. Africa needs help. That is the predominant narrative out there. And I will confess that what we're increasingly seeing is that it's not necessarily narratives that are coming from non-Africans. Africans are also buying into that belief system. You know, somebody actually said to me the other day that, you know, I'm so tired that, you know, I was coming up with something and somebody said to me, look, but you need to go and get help. Why don't you sort of, you know, apply for funding? And her thing was, why must I always go and find help from someone? Why can't I do it as an African? And the pe people in her environment were telling her, no, you need to go and get a, a consultant. You need to get funding. You need to do that from outside. So we are imbibing these stories ourselves. We're imbibing this narrative. And it affects us in ways that, you know, we're still trying to understand and unpack the impact of these narratives. And that's a big piece of research work that African Oculture will do. But just, you know, quickly just go back to how what our approach will be. We've sort of identified three big priorities that we want to do as organization because changing the African narrative is not an easy mandate. It's a massive, massive challenge. Um, but there are three things we want to do, and it's underpinned by one big thing. The one big thing that, we, that underpins everything we do is, is research. We want to find out, actually, what are the narratives? Because I've said one narrative, which we have seen, is that Africa is like it is in need of help. Africa needs to be helped. But there's there good narratives. There are bad narratives floating around. And there are narratives where actually you never see Africa mentioned before. But what are they? We need to identify what they are. We need to figure out where they are coming from. Because narratives are made up of stories over time. So what are the stories that are feeding into those narratives? Where are those stories coming from? What platforms? What media? Which countries? Because if you think about it, most people, if I say Africa, there are 54 countries in Africa, but most people will think about Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, you know, Ghana. There's a handful of countries that come up consistently. We rarely think about Gambia or Equatorial Guinea. So there's a handful of, com of countries that actually equal Africa to a lot of people, right? So we want to know what those countries are and what they say about those countries. So there's a whole lot of stuff we need to unpack about narrative that we haven't done yet. And that's one of the priorities for us. And also just to understand the impact of it. So let me give you an example of narrative, two examples. One is xenophobia in South Africa, right? Xenophobia is predicated on the fact that South Africans don't really trust other Africans, right? It's because of the stories they believe. They believe that they are going to come and take their jobs. They're going to, I mean, that's that's the biggest one, the economic thing, you know, people taking their jobs. But it's based on stories. It's not necessarily based on facts because there are far more, if you could actually look at the facts, which I don't have facts, but you will see that, you know, there are much, many more South Africans working than there are foreigners, and we're not all coming in. Another sort of um, story the world believes is that uh, migration. Africans are getting in boats and going to Europe and America. It's not true. The biggest amount of migration is happening within Africa. It's actually Africans traveling and moving about, for whatever reasons, within Africa. So I feel that people need to understand that there, there's, there's a lot of stories we believe about each other, but we also know that facts are not the way to change hearts. We don't change people's minds, you know, you, you, because these stories have come over time and they also feed into the belief system. But the one way that we do know that people can change is through stories. Mm -hmm. You know, people change their minds when they hear stories. Um, so, for example, that's why a lot of people are now trying to tell stories of individual migrants, the migrant story. They are not all horrible, terrible people who are coming to rape and pillage and steal. This woman lost her life, her livelihood in her country. So you're unpacking people's real stories. And that's why I mean that stories always come back to underline. They're always the, 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 there's always a data point. There should be a data point behind every story. But the story is actually what moves people. The story is what gives people that emotional um, connection. Um, and that's how you shift people's mindsets. So for us to try and shift people's mindsets about Africa, we have to get more of our stories out there. And there are two ways we're looking at doing that. One is by investing and make, doing grant making into the creative sector. So artists, storytellers, photographers, um, filmmakers, the people who can actually, through their creativity, visualize 
another type of Africa, a future Africa. And we also know that pop culture is one of the most influential ways of changing people's attitudes. And you have to look at things like what they've done in America. And if you think about the LGBTQI community and, and, and shows like Will and Grace, and what it did to normalize, you know, people being gay, pop culture has an incredible influence. Um, and that's fiction. It's fiction. It's storytelling. Um, so we are going to be investing in, in that sort of thing. And when I say investing, I mean grant making is that area because we are grant makers. And also we're going to be investing in grant making to the media sector. Um, again, because the media are the, the carriers of these stories. Um, I mean, yes, a lot of people get information on social media, but also, I think for cred for credibility and for just sort of verifying truth, we still need some of these big media brands. And you know, you know, you see stuff on social media, but you know, when you check it out on the BBC or on, on the Mail and Guardian, you kind of know it's true. So the art of journalism is still needed, and it's very much a respected one that we want to support. So we'd be making grants to media to get them to cover more of these stories that we feel are not well covered. Um, so that's an important part of the work we do. And then. Um, um, the two other pieces are we're going to be trying to figure out who else is working in the narrative change space in Africa because we're not the only ones. And I think we are in a very fortunate position that we do have funding and we're probably one of the few organizations tasked to do this. So we want to build the ecosystem. We want to bring all the people who are working in this space together so that we can start having a shared understanding of what narrative change means in Africa and what we want to see, what we want to move the narrative too. So it's like a shared vision and collaboration. So we will be doing a lot of convenings and trying to get the sector together so that there's a group of people, a group of organizations with the same concern, the same challenge, all working to a shared solution. So that's the um, one priority. Building that ecosystem. And the last one, and my favorite one, is disruption. How are we going to disrupt the current, you know, the amount of Kind of stars, harmful, stereotypical stories that we find on the continent. Um, and to me, Africa's no filters role is really one of the watchdog. I want to be the watchdog that's looking out for stories that are mm, not quite nuanced enough, not quite contextualized. Um, because I want to be clear, Africa No Filter is not a good news, you know, news service for the continent. You know, because a lot of people said, oh, well, you're going to be just making out there's no corruption, there's no poverty, there's no, no, we're not. We're saying tell contextualized stories and give you a quick example. I mean, recently, um, Beyonce released a trailer for her new album. I don't know if you've seen this, but it, it had a, it, a lot of sort of African depictions of animals and people, shirtless people. It's, a, it's an image of Africa that some people don't like because they feel that it takes us back to that stereotypical sort of, you know, us running around in skins. And there's been a lot of kind of dissent, let's put it that way, on um, on social media. Um, and the, the answer is that is not to eliminate that because that is Africa. We do have animals here. There are people who generally, you know, used to, in some cases, they still use their own traditional um, um outfits don't necessarily wear clothes. I mean, look at Swaziland, look at the reed dance. I mean, this stuff does happen. It's not like Beyonce is making it up. But the point is that it's got to be contextualized. Mm. We are not just that one picture of an old Africa. We have cities here. We have an incredible, amazing banking system, financial systems. We have, you know, we're contextualized. And the problem is that if we tell those stories, half the world already thinks that that's all we are, that we really only have animals. And I have been asked that, you know, do you have lions running around the streets? I mean, you know, so it's just a danger of perpetuating those myths about Africa, that we haven't evolved, that we are still back where we were. And so I, I, I understand the dissent and all the, uh, you know, the fighting back and the people who are unhappy with what Beyonce is doing, but she's an artist, you know, so there are two sides to every story. So that's kind of watchdog, you know, what are we saying about that? What should be the world saying? I'm always clear that, you know, Africa No Filter's role is like, we are the voice of, hey, hold on a minute, let's just contextualize. We're not whitewashing Africa. We're in choice of word, but <laughs> we're not. We're saying that there's just a lot more to it, like any country, like any continent. And I think the, the, the great kind of tragedy is how reductive um, other people have told the story and that uh, it's lovely to see, it's very welcoming to see kind of what you're doing and, you know, telling our own stories. What we are looking for with African culture is for people to truly understand 
that being an African is not the one thing they probably believe that it is. So if I could walk away and people think, oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, you can't say that you're African. You can't talk about that. About it. That's not right. Because right now there's, there's no defense because they don't know any better. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know any better, you know. So, <laughs> you know, it's funny because when you think about Black Lives Matter and the success of the movement, it's happened over a long period of time. You know, we're hearing about it now because it, there's a moment in time, I think COVID and, you know, George Floyd, the whole conference of events just happened. It was a perfect storm and it took off. We as Africans have been in a way not unified yes. and not constantly fighting for the same thing. Mm. And in a way, I don't even see African Filter as a, as a fight or a movement. All we're saying, I guess if there is a movement behind it, is that we're not one thing. We're not the one thing that you think we are. We're a contextualized society. So there will be um, corruption amongst us. There will be corrupt people, but there will be also be amazing leaders. There will be violence, but there's also spots of beauty. We, you know, we're just a multiplicity of things. And because right now, it's almost like there's a single story. Yes. The yeah. And if my long term vision, you know, is successful, it would be for people to think, well, no, okay, no, maybe I can't tell you what it is. Or to me, Africa is this, but it's not this one thing. It's about the multi multiplicity of sides to this continent, it's about contextualized and nuanced stories. Because new stories and diverse stories are transformational. Mm. And stories can change uh, the way human beings think, um, both on a macro level and on a macro level. What is that transformation that happens? And how do stories kind of con transform contexts and transform like even worlds and economies? You know, because, because as a human being, you know, like, for example, when, when I did my series of books called Nolly Books, Mm -hmm. um, somebody, you know, I call them African chiclet romance novels. And somebody said, is African romance different to the rest of the world's romance? I said, no, it's not. There's certain fundamental human basic things that we all do. We have, we, there's a need for us to connect. We fall in love the same way. We eat the same way. We sleep the same way. And it's those things in a story that humanize people. And then when you, that person is humanized, then you connect to them. So if, you know, just going back to the point I made about migration, and when we've seen this mass of Africans moving into Europe and they suddenly take one out and you paint a picture of this person, you see she's a person she had a life, she had the same aspirations that you did. She wanted her children to go to school. She didn't want to be like traipsing across the ocean on a boat ready to let you lose her life, but she did it because she wanted something better. Everybody can identify with that. It starts starts making it, it it connects with the heart and i think that's what's sort of the importance of storytelling and that's what you need to try and get it's turning issue mm -hmm. which migration is into a personal story and personal stories move um and i will always say this that you know i i mean i don't really read magazines anymore when I say magazines, like, uh, you know, women's magazines, I don't know, the world has moved on, you know, when you used to have your Marie Claire and Cosmo and all of that. I remember when I used to read those stories, I used to love Marie Claire in particular because I would click immediately to the human interest stories. There was always like a, a human interest story. And one of the big ones that I think really shifted the way I thought about things was when they had an interview with an, uh, a woman from Afghanistan who was covered in a hijab. And they were, she had told her story that she was a normal, you know, emancipated woman. She didn't cover her face. She wore very, you know, Western clothing until the Taliban moved in. And she then, they had to cover, which she did. But after they, the Taliban left she was she didn't take her um hijab off she or is it hijab or she kept it on and she was explaining what life was like behind it she said that she actually feels more powerful that she can see people they can't see her they don't know what she's thinking so she felt more powerful and she felt she could move in spaces in a way that she couldn't before so she chose to keep it on and that's one of the first times i thought my god you know just stepping into her shoes and seeing her view of the world from where she sat behind this veil, I got it. I understood that it's their choice. So storytelling is powerful, yeah. 
hugely powerful Moki because it takes you to places and it's a co-creative kind of endeavor um, that takes you to places that you haven't been before and if you enable it it can open minds and I'm seeing kind of uh, explanations for intelligence that speak about diversity yeah and um, the great danger in our world right now is that there are these extreme polarities and it seems to me there's almost a thinning out of stories um, or lack of tolerance uh, uh, for stories. Yeah. So this is kind of really, really required. Um, one thing I will say is that when you say that there's a lack of stories, I think it's not so much as a lack of stories, but I feel the way the digital world has evolved, it is polarizing the access we have to stories. So unless I follow, you know, this particular thing, I'm unlikely to see a counter story because I'm being fed things that I like. Yes. You know, this is exactly what happened in the US, why people didn't see Trump coming. Because if you watch CNN, you think everybody thinks Trump is crazy. But no, <laughs> they're the Fox News people who don't. But I don't watch Fox News. So that's actually what's happening. It's not that the storytelling is not happening. It's that the storytelling itself, the manner in which it's being delivered, is polarizing. That's actually the challenge for me. So we started with identity. And uh, we talked about how um, stories have created our uh, created your identity, Murky. Yeah, is it true to say that uh, stories affect our position in the world and how we see ourselves in the world? And um, how does that relate um, to what you're trying to do with Africa No Filter? I think storytelling is intrinsic and it's central to almost every piece, everything we do. Um, because it's, it's how we interact with each other. It's understanding people's stories. It's hearing them. So in terms of what African and Filter is trying to do, we are trying to, you know, I think in a way do two things. One is to let people know the importance of story and narrative, because I think people don't realize how important it is. I mean, you will hear people say, oh, we need to change the African narrative. They don't really know what that means, or they don't really know what it takes to do that, because there are times when those same people who say we don't like the narrative about Africa are actually inadvertently feeding it because of the stories they tell or the things they say about the continent. So giving that sort of sense of awareness, that sort of just, you know, sensitivity and just awareness of the importance of narrative, the importance of story is one thing that I think African Oprah really wants to do with Africa and Africans. We are, after all, the storytelling, you know, continent. We're the oral, you know, storytellers. Um, and I think the other thing is to build the capacity of the people who are trying to do it. Because I think the other challenge with the continent is that, you know, our media outlets are being are hemorrhaging right now. And maybe this is a, the story of the world's media, but I think particularly here on the continent, we are not the greatest written storytellers. Um, and I think supporting our media to be able to cover more stories, cover more people, cover just more examples of of, of this continent's greatness in many, many areas of trigger is something that I feel Africa no filter wants to do. We want to do that. And I guess in a way the third thing is just to strengthen the creative storytellers because what I realized that when Africa no filter started, all my funders are American. They are all American foundations because American foundations realize and support the importance of media and the importance of arts and culture. And arts and culture for me is just form these are the true storytellers of our society. So I've come into a space where I'm trying to say, if I'm not here and if Ford is not here and Illuminate and Open Society and Bloomberg and Comic Relief, who supports the storytellers? Who, who supports the arts and culture sector? And I want to be part of the group of people, because I'm not the only one, who are elevating the importance of storytellers mm -hmm. and creators in, in the world, because it's not a nice to have, it's an absolute necessity. And if you look in the history of Africa, the, um, over time, were some of the most remarkable kind of in Nigeria, kind of book festivals and literary festivals and creative festivals that, you know, like in the 60s and that sort of thing, yeah, that were kind of 
like groundbreaking and do we need to kind of bring back kind of uh, uh, big literary and big storytelling festivals? Do we need to kind of innovate new ways of connecting to each other? And um, what do we need to do and what can the marketing and creative industries do? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right about, you know, festivals. And I've just been put on the board of this um, organization called, it's the International Festivals Assembly. Um, and they try and bring festivals together globally and support them. There's training on how to run festivals. And last time I asked, I said, is there a database of festivals that are happening in Africa? And they're a huge number, um, but they're not well-funded. Mm. Big ones don't really happen that much anymore. And I remember, you know, without giving away too much about my age, but in the 70s, um, late 70s, there was something, or maybe it was in the early 80s, called Festac. It was the most phenomenal, most phenomenal festival in Nigeria. African Americans came, they still, I even remember the song, you know, like 40, 50 years later. That's how powerful it was then. We don't, we don't have a lot of that because cash money is, is tight on the continent. And we are, you know, if it's about priorities, whether it's educational or health you spend on, culture just slips through. Most arts and cultures department in, in, in Africa, in ministries, they don't give much money. They don't have the funding to give, you know, to the arts and culture sector. And that sector has to be supported. Uh, would it be fair enough to say that investing in the arts, investing in narrative, investing in story, um, that we're very much kind of investing in the soul of Africa, kind of the rebuilding of the soul of Africa and our narrative and our kind of uh, collective ability to collaborate and to understand each other? You're right. I think that's a really nice way of putting it, would be investing in the soul of Africa, because I think that's absolutely I think that's what we need to do. But again, I realize that we've always got to balance things with, oh, you know, if we're taking money from one part and putting it in another, we're basically borrowing from Peter to pay Paul because there's finite resources. But I feel that people should carve out and find ways to support the arts. And I think traditionally we've looked at government for every solution in Africa. So, you know, government is a big employer. Government is a big funder of initiatives. But government, and I think with arts and culture, We've got to move beyond that and look to ourselves um, to see how we support the sector because government just doesn't. In a lot of countries, I mean, South Africa being, you know, a little bit, um, you know, different. In fact, I spoke to um, British Business Art South Africa, Basa, the CEO today, and he was saying that 80% of their funding comes from the government. And I thought, wow, isn't that amazing? South Africa is unique in a lot of ways, um, you know, in that it it, it, it it does have funding from taxpayers to do um, things and it does support arts. So um, if there's a message that you have to the marketing fraternity in South Africa, what role do they have uh, to play in telling Africa's story in a way that we can all be proud of and in a way that makes uh, good sense and that most of all is useful to this continent and the people of this continent? Yeah, yeah I will say that I think South, the South African marketing advertising sector have gone, done a very good job of 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 bringing in diverse faces into the stories that they tell um, because they are reflecting a slice of life. But the one area that I I, I feel that we we can do a little bit more around is that it feels as if the, the advertising industry is selling one story. It's selling one aspiration to everybody. There's a middle class aspiration, and that's what everybody wants to have a home that looks the same. They want to have all of these things. And the reason why I say that is that part of this is the importance of, of, of looking at different people's lives and seeing how different people live. Um, we don't all live the same way. And the, the biggest explanation for this is that if you go into, um, you know, like a, I don't know, call, call it a like a squatter camp. From the outside, it looks like just shacks. Mm. Walk in there and, you know, it's a proper little kitchen, it's got TV, it's got everything you want. But that's, they also need DSTV or need, or they buy DSTV, they also buy those products. But the environment is not the, what we see on television. So I would say to marketers that there is more than one way. The audience you have don't all live in townhouses, and that's not always the same aspiration, because I feel the world is selling the world one aspiration. And I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Mm -hmm. And I just think that the only, I think advertising has a lot to do with that marketing of selling this one vision, this one way of living. And that's where the problem lies, because there are lots of people who fall outside of that. 
lots of us. Um, and I think if we are trying to reflect society, we have to do a little bit more to reflect society. Uh, the one thing we would say in journalism is uh, get out from behind your desk. And perhaps the same thing is true for uh, marketing, you know, that uh, marketers need to go out into the world. I agree. I agree. If we look at the advertising sector and communication sector, um, unfortunately, it is not as transformed as it should be. And uh, we see uh, big agencies that are untransformed, and we see the sector itself that is not as transformed that it sh as it should be, both in terms of empowerment and in terms of uh, gender. There's such a long way to go. What do we still need to do to bridge the gap? And how can how can one uh, walk deeper into story to kind of open things up? I don't think this is unique to the advertising sector. I think that there needs to be true transformation. And I think there's been studies that have shown that creativity comes when you have a diverse group of people trying to solve a challenge or come up with a new idea. So I feel that agencies that don't transform, like genuinely transform from top to bottom, are in danger of becoming extinct. So that's something that they need to kind of, you know, do for themselves. But I, I feel that if we were all to embrace more of our storytelling, there'll be a natural fascination. Who doesn't like a good story? Rather than see us as bringing in transformation and bringing in black people, mm, see it like, let's understand their story. Let's understand their story. Because like I said, that's what connects us all. They have the same aspirations. They have the same desires. You know, they fall in love the same way. We go to the toilet the same way. If we start seeing people as an individual stories that we can impact, just, it makes it less of a scary, oh my God, we need to transurbe, transform, we're going to bring some strange people into our space, they're not like us. We shouldn't be. We don't read the same story every day. And as you say, the, the transformation uh, research all shows that diverse uh, companies uh, present much better outcomes um, economically than everybody else, yeah, yeah. which is beautiful. It's true, but we have to know that it's true um uh transformation because you know people can say well look at our number and you know and you find that you know the transformation that's happening with the you know non-computerized staff you know it's the you know staff are in the kitchen or the staff on the gate so that's not really transformation you've got the numbers you can show it with the data unpack the story of the company and you'll see that actually it's not really the way it is so i'm just saying that we need to be careful that we are talking about true transformation mm. and not just on paper. And would you define true transformation as a story where everyone has a role and everyone participates and everyone has a purpose and meaning? Yes, I mean, I would. I think that's a really good way of looking at it. And, I, you know, transformation is really trying to say that does your, is your, does your organization reflect the society that you're in and that you're serving? Because every organization is serving somebody or something. And I think that that's, that's what transformation is, that you're bringing all the different pieces together. And, they, and, and you know, the thing about a jigsaw, you may not see the organ in it until it's all put together in place. And I think that that's what happens when you've got true, real working transformation. It does all work. One last question. Who's your key audience? I mean, who, who matters most to you? For this work... There was a lot of discussion around, oh, are we trying to influence how Americans or Westerners think about Africa? Are we trying to influence ourselves? I, I realize that we are actually trying to influence ourselves. And the reason why we may inadvertently target Westerners is because those perceptions are still coming at us. We are still watching global news. We are watching American movies, British movies. And African Filter last year actually commissioned a study, um, which the University of Southern California did. And they unpacked, I think, 77,000 hours of entertainment and news co television coverage in the U.S. to find that, you know, Africa was hardly ever mentioned. So we've got this obsession with America. America's not concerned, doesn't really care about us. But the few times when there were mentions of the continent, Invariably, it wasn't particularly positive, and often it was just Africa as one, like this monolithic 
thing. It wasn't, you know, the four countries. It was just one thing. But also, there just wasn't a lot of it in the entertainment. So the way that people were learning about Africa was not through entertainment, which is how we learn about a lot of things. It wasn't through the films. It wasn't through the content. Half of it was on, on um, in the news. And what was being covered in the news, as journalists will do, is cover the bad elections, the violence, the poor, you know, examples of leadership. So the only input on Africa a lot of Americans were getting was negative. So at the same time, I'm looking at global platforms and things that people in Africa consume, but my primary audience is young Africans because for me, as everybody says, I mean, this continent is young. It is. And if the young people are believing those harmful stories or negative stereotypes about the continent, they will not have an African dream. They will have an American dream and they'll want to leave and or they will not, they'll stop being innovative. They'll stop being hopeful. And then you know, we'll all be sitting here thinking, where did we go wrong? Because we put in, you know, we educated them. We, you know, we built a nice health system. We did this, but we didn't get to the soul. Thank you so much, Maggie. Thank you. All right. Have a great weekend. Thank you. All right.